is, it is um, multiple stakeholders coming together and reaching a consensus on what they think are the key elements of legality. And in addition, um, kind of creating this wish list of where they think this legality can evolve to something even more positive. Um, I think that is the positive uh, in, in this definition of legality, which is maybe rather in the structure and the setup than uh, in the language that is used. Mm. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I'm thinking yeah. through all the possibilities there, but I'm afraid I've got to draw this uh, session to a close. I'm extremely grateful for the uh, three contributors, and maybe if you're around at the end, maybe these folks might want to buttonhole you to inquire further about forestry issues. But thanks very much for your Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, the final uh, session the speakers would like to uh, come forward and buy these seats. Do you want to take a seat? And is it your turn? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, I'll just say a few words by way of judgment. Yes. <laughs> Um, there's a sort of common theme, I think, which has uh, run throughout the uh, conference, which is about um, uh, consumption and the way we use uh, resources and the, the trade aspects of that specifically. And um, waste is certainly in, in line with that. I mean, it's been a, a long-standing uh, problem of environmental law for as long as I've been around, which is a long time. Um, but it, it somehow transformed itself in recent years. We've uh, looked at um, an, uh, waste as a, an environmental problem, something which generates pollution. That's a traditional reason for regulating uh, waste uh, management. Uh, but increasingly, the, the tendency is to view this as something different. That's, a, say, a wasteful use of resources that should in some or other way be reused. So we move on to these ideas of recycling society, circular uh, e economy and so on. So I'm, it's a subject that I'm particularly fascinated uh, by. Uh, sadly, uh, the, the time's never enough to get into everything you would do, but we do, I'm going to shut up, we've got three expert speakers who I'm sure will be able to give some really good insights uh, into that. And the first one is, is Pieter Barczak, if I pronounce that uh, correctly, who's Polish, um, and has done various works as a surveyor, as a, uh, an environment uh, ministry officer, but most recently um, working with the European Environmental Bureau. Some of you will know this organisation, which is a, a grouping of NGOs. So somehow or other, we have these 140 um, national in, environmental NGOs and Piotoni's colleagues will pull together from them consistent views as to what is needed. Uh, we look forward to your presentation. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you, Professor, for a nice introduction while we wait for the presentation. I thank you very much for remaining in the room. Uh, we're going to talk about rubbish. It's amazing that you want to hear about rubbish, but we will show you how complex the rubbish issue may be. I'm Polish, I don't speak English, so uh, um, however I have the presentation, so if you don't understand, you may see it here, maybe some spelling uh, mistakes will occur. Anyway, um, I don't work on TTIP, I don't know anything about that, it's for you, the, your homework to, to find linkages to that, okay? I'm not even going to attempt that. Um, I'm going to speak about a couple of things, consumers, products, exactly what is written, packaging and waste, uh, and also how the new uh, hype word uh, of circular economy is, is actually a way to reconcile the economics and environment through better waste management. Thank you also to everybody for inviting the EB, for the organizers. Um, we are an umbrella organization that uh, already for, for 40 years uh, we have been uh, consulting, lobbying the commission and the parliament and we are based in Brussels, so you know what does it mean. Um, you can check uh, more details on the website, but not now, please, just uh, listen to me what I'm going to say. We, but we work not only with NGOs, we work also with uh, waste management organizations, with industry, with retailers, with producers, 
to find best ways. I mean, on, we're talking on my issue on, wa um, on waste issues to buy to find best ways to reduce the problem. The problem is not only end of pipe problem, as uh, Professor said. We are ha we have to look more upstream on how the products are designed. That's why we are we are very much um, calling for zero waste. Mariel will also explain that. Uh, Mariel explained practical um, uh, examples already. But at the EU level, we see that there is the former. Commissioner Janusz Potocznik, uh, he also said zero waste is possible, and more and more politicians are, are you know, tr finding this um, this solution as a, a viable solution, as a, the one that works. Although we still have problems in many countries, in Eastern especially. So um, we also run this campaign, uh, make resources count, where we want to show waste management has to be improved, but not only by thinking end of pipe, but by thinking upstream, how to, how to decouple the growth, uh, economic growth from environmental um, de degradation uh, and, and resources use. It has to be an absolute uh, decoupling, which means less resource use. It's not only that we are going to more, more make resources more efficient. No, we have to reduce them. And I'm going to tell you why. Um, so yes, there is an economic um, reason behind. We are losing a lot of industry, you know that. China going, a lot of them going to China, to India. Do we have to really um, hope that they will come back? Well, you can hope, but I, I don't believe it will happen. But what we can do, we can invest in post-consumer industry. We can have those recycling facilities here, repair, very important facilities, repair uh, activities. We can invest in them. That's why we could. That's where we could make uh, economic uh, economic uh, benefits. It uh, it is about uh, electronic uh, textiles, uh, wooden furniture, whatever. At the European Union, there's last year there was a binding document agreed by all the member states, which is seven environmental um, action program, where all the member states agreed bindingly to to reduce to stop uh, landfilling and insulation of recyclable and compostable. So there is a not only a will, but there are already binding uh, agreements that have to be followed. Um, they all, all of them, they follow the waste um, management uh, hierarchy. Um, well, this is a very complex issue, but I guess uh, um, maybe for many of you, it's the first time you see that. Uh, the first part, the first most important thing of, of waste management is to prevent waste. Best waste is no waste. Then the second one is reuse. reuse. We have to um, we have to think uh, about ways that somebody's waste can be somebody's resources. We have to reuse it again before even thinking about recycling. Recycling is on, only a transformation of material. That is the last step. And the last, last step, which we don't like, is the disposal. And disposal means landfilling and incineration is equal. That's why European Union came up with um, the directives, two directives, one of them on waste management and one circular economy. They are quite ambitious, but achievable. Um, it means to achieve 70% recycling average um, overall. Uh, I will not go into details of that, but also stopping landfilling um, of recyclable and compostable waste by 2025. But also important part, they are aiming to boost eco-design as an important tool to actually improve waste management. Whatever we put today on the market will become waste in 5, 10, 15 years. So the time. To, uh, to improve waste management in 15 years is now. OK, uh, this hype, these buzzwords uh, <coughs> of, um, of circular economy is everything. Everybody thinks of circles. But what those mean? I would like to, to, to emphasize that, because this is often forgotten. Those circles should be slow. What does it mean? It means that products should be durable. They should last a long time. They should be repairable also, so that they extend their lifetime even longer. They should be small or thin. Or me, they should be minimum. It means that we, we need sufficient materials. We don't need anything that is not necessary, single-use items. Even if they are perfectly recyclable or, or compostable, take plastic bags or any packaging, plastic packaging, or uh, food waste. If it's not necessary, we don't, we, but if it's, even if it's um, tot perfectly recyclable, it doesn't mean we have to produce the extent of that. They should be local. The, um, the territorial hierarchy um, is the key word here, but also circular economy starts at home. We produce waste at home, we have to separate it at home. And waste is also uh, a value. We have to keep it in our communities to, 
to, to use this value. Also, not only materially, physically, but also as an as a incentive to think uh, about new solutions. And they have to be clean. This is very important. It, it, it is quite uh, uh, heavily discussed, discussed now in Brussels. Uh, for, for example, PVC industry. PVC is perfectly, perfectly recyclable, but it con consists of um, different toxins, uh, phthalates. And, and we have to, even if we want to have um, high recycling, we should not put back in the loop any toxics again, because we will have a problem for many years to come. So we have to clean the cycles. Um, the design, which is another part that we are working on, I, I, as I say, I say again, waste and design of products is very much interlinked. Already 80% of environmental impacts of products are de determined at design stage, and this comes from the European Commission. So I believe here in the cre creativity of retailers, or of producers, if they can produce nicely, you know, um, uh, nice items that they want us to sell, to buy, uh, they also should use this creativity to creativity to, to, to improve their products, to, to make them uh, that we want to keep them for a long time, like, like packaging. I would like to have packaging that I want to keep, like nice boxes and, and use them maybe again. But uh, a nice example of this, the, how design is important, plastic bags. This is a pure example of badly designed product. We keep it only for a couple of, um, I don't know, hours maybe, and then we dispose it. And it takes much time to, to, to decompose. So, so they were fortunately recently tackled by the binding uh, legislation at the EU. Um, you can check everything in the emails, uh, sorry, in the in the in the internet. Now, uh, to be to come back on the ground and to show something practic, practic, happening in practice. This is just one example, but this is already happening. Also here in in uh, London, there is a, a store unpacked, unpacked, unpackaged. Sorry, I never been there. I don't know that. I don't uh, represent them. But there are also many other in in Europe. On Unverpackt, Biosphere, Granel in Spain, Effect Corta in, in Italy, uh, in Germany, in, uh, also in Austria. So in, in France, La Recharge also. So there are already business cases happening that um, non-packaging shops are, are taking their fair um, role. It could be even bigger, but <laughs> I still have been saying that I don't say that it will be a mainstream, no. But it already shows something. It shows possibilities. It shows that we can reconcile economy, morality, morality, and uh, and and environment. Actually, what are the the pros of those for consumers? You can buy only what you need. So we also look. We see that we can uh, prevent food waste here. We buy as much as we need. So only so much as we need. Uh, we can deduct the the cost of the packaging from the cost of the product. So we pay only for the product. Um, this is interesting, which is a huge argument for me. With the same amount of, mo of money, we can actually buy more products. Means we are not bound to quantities. We can buy exact quantity, and we can buy extra spices and extra sauces. You know, we can make our cuisine maybe more interesting with the same amount of money. As I told you, plastic bags is one of the packaging, but there are many more that are, that are, that are not even recyclable because of their very difficult and complicated uh, con con contain. So next items we're going to tackle are, are those listed here. Uh, just an example. Uh, we have to f focus on reuse, not only on re recycling. And uh, these are, the, the picture speaks for itself. Uh, I'm very much uh, a supporter of this kind of things. So promoting glass bottles and Deposit refund systems, which is in Germany. I don't know even if, if in the UK you have it, but it's quite useful. But not only a deposit refund system for plastic packaging, like, it's, like it is in Germany, glass bottles or, or refillable plastic bottles, they also exist. Um, something that can be reused, uh, reused again. Um, and many other containers that you can use. I will move uh, quicker. Uh, whatever is not possible to reuse, we have to make sure it will be recycled. So we have to 
make sure that this packaging is, is produced separately, uh, um, is separately collected, but it's also produced of materials that can be easily separated and recycled. Recyclers, they, they, they face huge problems today. Uh, they cannot recycle many of the, our things, and those things should be absolutely redesigned. Having said that, design for disposal or incineration has to be disencouraged, if not prohibited at all. If not um, possible to do that, those products should be put a special tax, which is, uh, in, we, um, in our jargon, we, speak, we say extended producer responsibility, this kind of tax, uh, in order to discourage production of them, in, in order to increase this, the price of it, of it, and in order to encourage those good products that make effort to be reusable or, or recyclable, to be um, um, bought and cho chosen. Um, these are, um, a, basically, I want to send you to our website where we have a couple of interesting uh, um, reports um, on, on advancing resource efficiency in Europe, on delivering resource efficient products. Um, please have a look at them and if you have more questions, uh, you can always uh, contact me. Here is the email and Twitter account. I will stop now. Thank you very much. Um, that was uh, informed and just uh, amazingly skillfully covering a lot of ground in the short time available. So that was great. And uh, you got the final message. Look at the website. There's a lot more issues there. I suspect our next uh, presentation is going to take us more towards the scientific aspects. This is from Professor uh, Margaret Bates, who's Professor of Sustainable Waste Management at the University of Northampton. So she's uh, looking at uh, landfill and related issues uh, from a, a scientific uh, microbiological biological perspective. Uh, she's currently chair of the Chartered Institution of Waste Management Scientific and Technical Committee and in 2016 will become president of CIWM. I suspect that's a, a momentous achievement. So well, well done. Congratulations to that. We look forward to uh, what you have to say. I'm going to talk about a very specific waste stream, which is we. I'm also going to do something which I criticise my students for, but then I've got my degree, so I can. Um, and that's to use the terms we and e-waste interchangeably. And that's really because if you're in Europe, it's we. If you go to Africa, which will be where I'll be mainly talking about, it's e-waste. Which is really annoying, because actually, if you say e-waste to people, most people in Europe know what you're talking about, and if you say we, everyone giggles. <laughs> so I'll be talking about this, specifically looking um, from an African dimension. So um, Africa is growing. don't think anyone's going to argue with that. Um, got more and more inhabitants all the time. The electronics market is growing there. And we've talked about, we look at e-waste as if um, here this country where hardly anyone has electronic equipment, but they do. And it's growing in the same way that our use of electronics is growing, so it is in developing countries. I think it's a bit weird. Like If you'd said to someone 10 years ago that pretty much everyone will have a smartphone where you can search the internet, watch films, take photos... Um, send emails and use it as a phone and then you'll have a laptop where you can do all of that except you can't use it as a phone but you can have video phone calls on it and then what you really need is a tablet which is somewhere in between those two things that duplicates everything the others do <laughs> now how many people in the room have a tablet yeah I bought mine for my mum for her 79th birthday when she'd become addicted to Candy Crush Saga so I've got no moral high ground on it at all so the situation where we're talking about what we discard is going to be replicated in Africa and it's going to be replicated in developing countries very soon. So by 2030, developing countries will be throwing away more electronic waste than we are. 
and it's a valuable resource. It prevents, presents economic opportunities for green jobs, new businesses, new investment. And to be honest, it's not going to be that long. We're already worrying in Europe about these raw materials that we want, that we need for all this electronic equipment. And soon we're going to be in the position where we're wondering why we're selling this resource to other countries. The collection of e-waste in Africa is not a problem, but the health and environmental standards are, if I say poor, that's being generous. They're appalling, and I'll explain why. There's very few countries where they have any international systems. In fact, there's only two countries where there are international standards. And part of this issue is there's no uniform one-size-fits-all. Everyone has a different system. Um, I'm sure many of you have travelled, and one of the things we all like about travelling is how different other countries are. So that gives you an idea, despite the fact that electronic waste is considered by many developing countries to be a priority waste stream, that gives you an indication of quite where they're at in Africa. So what you'll see is there's actually only South Africa that enforces their e-waste regulation. Others have published it, and others have it in draft. In fact, despite the fact that I have uh, no legal background at all, my dad was a lawyer, but I don't think that counts, um, <laughs> I've helped two of those countries develop their legislation, which I have to say was a very weird experience, and got very tied up in definitions, particularly on producer. So historically, when we've talked about the e-waste problem, we've talked about the export of e-waste from developed to developing countries. So basically, in Europe, we're talking about our, dumping our waste on Africa. In the US, they're talking about dumping their waste in Asia, usually. That's how generally the link goes. I have to say, though, it's not illegal in the States because they're one of the few countries that hasn't signed the Basel Convention, which is always a good way of winding up environmentally friendly Americans to point out that the logic is that Banning the export of hazardous waste to developing countries is anti-free trade. Sitting with your theme. So this is um, Tima in Ghana, big port. And what you can see there is a picture of lots of containers. And oddly enough, many of those containers are full of cars, and many of those containers are full of cars with electronic waste in. There's an issue with export because there is no difference between a customs code for new or a customs code for second hand. And a lot of the stuff that gets illegally exported gets illegally exported as personal possessions. So lots of stuff being done. The Basel Convention, um, I was going to say my favourite convention, but then that sounds really sad, but it is, um, which is meant to stop the export of hazardous waste to developing countries. The other bit of it that people nicely forget is it's got a large element of we're meant to share information and help people on how to develop their own infrastructure. There's a standard called PASS 141 that is meant to prove that something is reusable rather than waste. Legally, that comes with a guarantee of one month, which I think is not going to convince anyone something's not waste. Our environment agency in the UK are absolutely brilliant at stopping containers. They, at one point, had a 97% hit rate. So of all the containers they stopped thinking it had electronic waste in it, they were 97% right. And as the guy leading it told me, the other reason is because people in port stop us and say, while you're here, could you open this one? Because we're a bit suspicious of it. Um, so there's that on the export. Many countries now are looking at importing, um, at registering the importers. And the reason for that is, if you're in Africa, if you're in Kenya, and I tell you who's a producer, you might think the producer of these two computers were Dell and Apple. But if Dell and Apple don't sell anything in Kenya, there's no point having legislation that targets them. So then it's important you have a definition where you can target them. They're subject to your legislation. So it's whoever imports it. So therefore you need them to register. So there's guidelines on this. There's also another convention called the Bamako Convention that was developed by African countries who felt that Basel really wasn't strong enough. Um, Bamako hasn't really had much happening, but it's really going in the right direction. And it's showing the importance that countries give to the, this issue. Um, so the study many, many people quote is the Basel Action Network Band Study in 2005. 
um, and if you go onto the ban website you can see a video of it and you can see Alba Market with a big almost lake of used PCs if you went there now you wouldn't be able to see that because they've built on it and what they found and this is the quote you see a lot 75% of the material imported to Lagos was junk, so it was e-waste and therefore illegally shipped. However, this is changing. It's changing from emphasis there and here. So the Environment Agency, I've put a lot of figures in here, I'm assuming these are going to be available on the website or something, so you can look at them. But basically, what they said in, in 2009, only one in eight shipments was waste. Still, that's pretty awful, but it's a lot better. Then, if you look at Ghana, you find that in 2009, 70% of the imports were second-hand, but the majority of those were actually repairable and sellable. And the other thing is it's not like trying to get your electronics fixed here. It's really, really easy. My phone broke, someone took it away, fixed it, gave it back to me the next day, it cost me 50p. I don't think we'd have such an issue here if it was like that. You get a screen broken, a couple of quid to repair it, then rather, I think someone was telling me 120 quid to have an iPhone screen replaced. It's not surprising we tend to buy new. And their collection rates are brilliant. 95% collection rate in Ghana of electronic waste. We're not even close to that. And it's not as selective as ours is. If we started to just look at small, binnable electronic waste, our, our um, targets would look even worse. And there's been a whole change in the trend. So here, the black, thick black, shows where what we've been historically worried about. Developing con sorry, developed countries selling to developing, but now what we're finding is that more material is going to developed countries. So we're importing, but actually when you look at individual countries, what you're finding is there's a lot more stuff being done locally. It's an increasing problem. So these are, um, all these are photos from Africa. So this is really common. This is a place, uh, this is Westminster, one of the big five, five, four, I can only have a name for them, but I think I've forgotten one. Um, electronics markets in, um, in Lagos, in Nigeria. Everybody has phones. If you go to Kenya, for example, most people will have two mobile phones because there's a big market in fakes. So when it breaks, you need to have another one. And also the majority of people in Kenya bank on their phone. So not having a phone is really important. So people are very concerned. So there's big increases in how much computers are being used big increase in mobile phone subscribers. I get accused of being miserable a lot because I speak to people who export computers to schools in various African countries and they say, aren't we great? We're exporting all this stuff. And I said, what happens at the end of its life? And they would just think of the impact that um, it's having on these children who now learn all this stuff. Said like how that might kill them at the end of its life. It's not, I'm not usually that miserable. <laughs> Depends. <laughs> don't, don't ask any of my students. Um, anyway, so people say it's being shipped to Africa for recycling, but actually the recent studies have shown that the value's really in the second-hand equipment, not in the recycling value. So the majority of it is really being driven by reuse value. And a lot of the stuff where there's no reuse market here, there is in Africa. Also, 80 to 90% of the population in some of these countries can't buy new and so in some countries where we've had high profile banning of um, second hand, mainly European goods, what's happened is energy using goods that they've had to buy stuff that is specifically made for the African market in China. And it is specifically made badly. So if you go to a Chinese manufacturer, you will see where they make the shit to export to Africa. And the African people don't want that. They want the good stuff that we just don't need anymore that works perfectly well. So there's a huge demand for this stuff. And anyway, it doesn't really matter because the problem isn't where it comes from. The problem's what you do with it at the end. So really, if there's rubbish piled up outside your house at home, 
you might be slightly concerned about who's dumping it, but the main thing you want is someone to take it away and deal with it. So we need to look more at a solution. So these photos are a place in Ghana. In my little world, it's a very famous place in Ghana. It's called Agdabloshi. Has anyone heard of it? It is the most toxic place to human health on Earth. So Chernobyl is number two. Nobody lives near Chernobyl and has done for 20 years. 74,000 people live near here. So it's having a big impact. You'll also, also hear regularly that kids work here. Now you'll notice on this picture there are no children because it was school time. So all the kids are in school. What happens when school shuts is the kids come back and work with their parents. It's not great, but it does cause difficulties because really child size PPE puts you in that whole moral ground where it gets a bit dodgy. So this is an example of somewhere where they're trying to do it differently. This is a facility in Kenya, in Nairobi, set up partly by Hewlett Packard. Um, and they work to international standards. So Red Cross sent their stuff to them. And the difference is, prior to this, they had to export everything. So what they have is they have a centralised recycling plant and lots of collection points. And so this is a way of making sure those informal collectors, the scavengers, actually have a role. And the idea is that then they can carry on to earn their living without killing themselves. So they have to have sound recycling practices. It's a network of collection points. These are pretty much based on shipping containers because they're secure, watertight, etc., etc. Every collection point acts as a franchise or a micro business going onto the treatment facility. And this is really where people who historically worked in the e-waste sector work in, um, in this, but as you can see, there's PPE. Also, they have to stick to the standards. If they're caught not wearing the PPE, not operating to standards, they lose their franchise. And there's a big plus to being on the franchise to this. So if you're running, um, I don't know, there's one in Makuru. So the collection point in Makuru and the local Guinness factory rings up um, the treatment facility and says, can you take our electronic waste? They tell you who your nearest collection point is. So you get all that material and you get paid for it. But they have to pass a test. We, had, we wrote the test and we did the tests and there was some debate about what the pass mark should be. And I was told 100% was a bit harsh. And then I said, so which of these life-threatening things do you not want them to know? And, that, and then we did read on 100% and various people failed the test, which was interesting because then the people who'd been pushing for the lower pass mark were interested to see how much they valued passing. Though we did go out for dinner with the minister that night who told me how proud he was that his son had passed the test. And I was very glad that his son had passed the test and that I didn't know who his son was before we did the test. So this is what you see all the time. This is standard practice walking down the streets of Lagos or in many other big cities. And this is what we're ending up with in a lot of situations. But to be honest, there's no real reason why it can't be like this. There's absolutely no systems. In fact, you get better recovery rates with manual intervention. And that's where they've got a lot of labour and very unreliable power. Whereas we have very expensive labour and lots of power. So we tend to use more inefficient systems. And also, on a purely selfish thing, I get to go on safari with work. Yeah. Thank you, Margaret. That was re really engaging, um, supremely well illustrated, and very thought-provoking about uh, the way forward in these uh, issues. The final uh, presentation is for Marielle Villela, if I've pronounced that correctly, I hope I have, who is, is looking uh, specifically at this um, issue of zero waste and works as Associate Director and climate policy campaigner with Zero Waste Europe, uh, the Global Alliance for Incinerator Alternatives. And she's uh, been very active in producing reports 
on European waste, double standards on waste and climate change. And uh, I, I'm very interested to hear what she's uh, to say about the progress towards uh, zero waste, the, the aim of the game, surely. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, thank you definitely for the invitation today. Um, it's the last presentation of the day. So I would like to start by raising a question to all of you. Um, if you were to go zero waste yourselves and you wanted to avoid all packaging, what is the thing, the overpackaged thing that you would miss the most? Think for yourselves, the thing that you love, if you wanted to go zero waste, ah, it would be so hard to <laughs> just not consume that, God. And now, um, if you may, just share your reflections with the person next to you, or to yourself. Um, <laughs> what do you think are the barriers to reduce waste? Just your first thoughts. This is not an exam. Just share with whoever is next to you. Just let's take a few seconds to say, what are the barriers that we face to reduce waste? It's too easy to, to dismiss responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. Those shops that I showed, yeah. they used to be very, very common. Deposits, the, um, you know, to go in and buy your cereal and scoop it in a bag or they used to be really common. And we used to go in the UK to rent electronic bags. Yeah. Okay, a lot of conversations going on. That's amazing. And and we're definitely going to take that back to the reception in just 15 minutes. So um, that's amazing. And, and maybe um, you can tell me now, whose responsibility do you think it is to reduce waste? And we can, um, you can raise your hand if you think it's the government. It's the government? The government is responsible, sure. Um, it's, is it industry? Do you think that it's industry that they are responsible? They are responsible, sure. Is it us? Is it consumers? Yes. Is it us as well? Is it government and industry? Sure. Is it government and us? Yes, as well. Well, yes. It's all of us. It's all of us as well, sure. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Definitely, um, waste is a complex issue and fascinating as well. Um, today I'm going to talk about zero waste and, and the sort of strategies that we are promoting, the sort of opportunities that we see in zero waste strategies and the opportunities that we see ahead. Um, we are an international network of groups working to end all forms of incineration, promoting zero waste alternatives and the European network Zero Waste Europe is here to support local groups in driving change and transforming our relationship with resources. In Europe, we have members in more than 13 countries and in the UK, there is the UK Without Incineration Network is our member here and the Zero Waste UK Alliance. And we are working closely as well with Zero Waste England and we have a representative here today that I'm very glad um, to be with. So um, for us, waste is actually not only a technical issue. This is a mirror of what is wrong with today's consumer society. When we have waste, it's actually because it's a failure of this system. It's a system that is linear and that it's based on this extraction and production and consumption and final disposal. And we, if we waste resources, it's because something is just not working. We think that by changing the way that we deal with waste, we are able as well to change society. So we are able to create green jobs. We are able to reduce the pollution in the environment. We are able to reinvigorate our communities, our local economies, and protect our environment. What we have inherited, and what is a bit challenging right now, is that 
um, in the 80s, in the 90s, especially in the north of Europe, there was a massive investment in creating incineration. Incineration was seen as a solution at the time, as a solution as not to landfill waste. And what we have now is a situation with overcapacity to incinerate. This is the report that is in our website if you want to consult the details, and in which it explains that uh, basically now we have European northern countries importing waste from the south of Europe because they don't have enough waste to burn and they have these massive facilities with lock-in contracts that you have to keep feeding, otherwise the business case will just not work. So this is, this is clear nonsense. And as Piot was mentioning before, Fortunately, the positive news is that in Europe, there is more and more awareness that we are facing in a scarcity, a resource scarcity crisis, and that we have to be working towards a resource efficient society. Um, it was a key moment when the seventh environmental action plan said that we needed to have more ambitious targets to increase reuse, to increase recycling, and make sure that we were going to reduce our waste. We love this tweet, <laughs> and Piot had it before, uh, because this is the former commissioner for the environment, and in growing momentum for zero waste strategies, he said, actually, good waste management needs goodwill and good organization. Zero waste is completely possible. Not only that, actually there is now a network of zero waste municipalities, more than 300 municipalities that are committing to zero waste goals. Last year, Ljubljana was the first EU capital that committed to zero waste goals. So there is growing momentum, there is growing awareness, there is more and more opportunity to be driving zero waste, resource efficiency, and more sustainability in the waste sector. But what is it that it is zero waste? When, when I say zero waste, how do we define zero waste? For us, zero waste is a goal, is an aim, and it's a strategy, it's a process um, in itself. And the commitment is to be continually minimizing residual waste that otherwise would be going to landfill and incineration. And we want that to go zero. Zero waste solutions include waste reduction, reuse, source separation, recycling, redesign, composting, biogas, and most importantly, consumer transformation. This has to be like, the way you organize this is gonna be local, and, and it's got to be to respect the local wisdom, but we can say that there are some principles that would guide a zero waste strategy that would that we would be promoting in, this, in our zero waste work. And the first principle is that we would commit to set a new direction away from waste disposal. That is very important because as soon as we get into contracts with incinerators, then there is a lock-in situation that will just be an obstacle for us to increase our recycling capacity. Um, we have cases in Italy where after 30 years, at the end of the life of an incinerator, they said, actually, now that the contract is ending, this is the time that we can rethink our waste management system and we can aim higher, because bef until then it had not been possible. So, um, yeah, this is the, a key opportunity, key opportunity for zero waste strategies, just leave incinerators behind and landfills, of course. A very big, a very important principle for us is to think in, with communities, to think in systems that are people-centered. And this is for at least two reasons. One is because when we are developing a waste management system, we will want people to be, we, we need this system to be adapted to the needs, to the local culture, it needs to be respectful, and therefore it needs to be, in this development plan, uh, it needs to have it needs to be developed in, consulta in consultation with people. It needs to count with the participation of the people. Um, this is a picture from the north of Spain in Guipuzcoa. Um, this is a community that was facing an incinerator proposal, and they not only won against this proposal, but they engaged the whole of their communities, and they uh, changed, transformed completely their waste management system, and it's one, now one of the best practices in, in Europe. 
it's not only important to engage with communities in the north, uh, in the global south this is especially critical. Um, in the global south there is the informal recyclers, is 1% of the population that depend that whose livelihoods depend on recycling. And what we've seen through working in partnership with them throughout the last year is that when they get the appropriate support to empower themselves and create cooperatives, they become amazing recyclers, efficient, and most importantly, they are able to improve their living conditions because normally, um, this is a sector that is facing a lot of marginality, a lot of criminalization that is completely unfair. So um, this is examples of different um, grassroots cycles all, uh, all over the world. And as well in San Francisco, as we've been doing a lot of work there with the trade unions of recyclers workers. Another principle, and this is maybe the more technical, is that we need to ensure a really good source separation because we need to ensure that the materials that we get is as clean as possible. And it's most importantly that we get separated the organic waste because the organic waste is the most problematic waste stream. Um, again, this example of the north of Spain, um, what we saw there is that in, in barely three years, they went from a separate collection of a little bit more than 30% to more than 77%. And at the same time, they decrease the generation of waste dramatically one year to another. And this was by implementing a source separation system with separate collection. What they did is to um, establish a system in which every household had a different bag in which they were putting different materials every day of the week. And they were also implementing community composting projects. And I think that was, that was one key of the success. They offered that by participating in these community composting projects, you would have a reduction on your tax bill. So in this way, you would create an economic incentive for people to do the right thing. This is the example that they did it here. It doesn't have to be done in the same way everywhere, but I think this is one of the most inspiring examples um, today. The last principle is that actually when we've had this amazing zero waste system and we are reaching a separate collection targets of 80%, there's going to be a last percentage, like a 10, 15% of things that we cannot recycle. What do we do with that? We need to design it out of the system. We need to redesign. We need to be looking at what is that, and we need to say, well, actually, anything that it cannot be reused or recycled should not be produced in the first place, should not be consumed in the first place. So we need to see ways, what is that, and go back to the producers and engage and say, actually, um, that, that should be redesigned, that it doesn't create a problem to all of us. Um, I would invite you to check our case studies of the best experiences in our website. This is examples of Italy, Slovenia, Catalonia, and also other places in the world, especially the cases of waste speakers are in Mumbai and Pune, but there is also the case of Flanders, amazing results in there, and the cases of San Francisco, so please download and check the specific details in, in there. And because it's been today mentioned a few times, and I think it's a critical issue and something that I've been working in the last years, I'd like to just put some, uh, just mention the relation, that how critical it is, how critical zero waste strategies can be for climate change mitigation. Um, let's think that, let's, let's take a step back and realize that actually greenhouse gas emissions are embedded in products, and, and that if we see um, greenhouse gas emissions from in products from a life cycle perspective we will see that there is a massive percentage of emissions there that, there that we can deal with so this is looking at the provision of goods and the provision of food for example if we look at that actually we realize that the 42 percent of greenhouse gas emissions come from our stuff and this is like the emissions that come from all this cycle so we see that actually by dealing with the things, that we, the, the things that we produce and the things that we consume, we actually have a quite an easy and you know, immediate way to be um, reducing waste. So achievements of zero waste for climate change mitigation. Recycle and compost offer 
a really good opportunity to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in every household in comparison to incineration and landfill gas collection. I'm going to be a bit quickly because I think I'm running out of time. Um, as well, if we produce things with recycled materials, the carbon footprint is going to be a lot lower since um, there's going to be a need for less energy and aluminium is a particularly interesting example of that. With the organic waste, this is amazing. Like if we think that actually the organic waste that we produce, we can make compost and that can go back to the soils that will have fertilizing for agriculture, that will increase the carbon sink capacity of soils, that will help us with the soil degradation that we are facing all over the world. And we think that in so many places, we see that food waste is just going to the landfill or to the incineration. It's just how crazy is that when we can just close the circle in such an easy way. And of course, we reduce the greenhouse gas emissions that are, um, that are embedded in waste disposal and also the toxic emissions because incinerators are a source of toxic emissions um, that are um, with um, that are really um, damaging for air pollution for our health um, some of the the worst pollutants of concern have been identified and it's great that we can avoid them and I've mentioned before the capacity that we have to create jobs. So that helps us as well in the sense of that we can create communities that are more resilient. So it's, um, it's also something that we need to think about when, when facing climate change. Um, so in conclusion, um, I hope I gave you reasons to think that zero waste is a key strategy um, to drive us towards a resource efficient society and a low carbon economy. That zero waste solutions actually including everything that I've mentioned and many more that probably you're thinking about could be implemented today. This is no secret. This is no um, such technological sophistication. This is no complication. We could do it today using existing innovations and we could have immediate results. And finally, just to finish with a quote of Professor Paul Conant, who is one of the celebrities in our small world, um, he said that even if waste incineration was safe, we would never made it sensible because it doesn't make sense to spend so much money to destroy the resources that we should be saving for future generations. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank, thanks tremendously, Mariel. That, that, that was so kind of a, a, uplifting. Whilst you know, environmental <laughs> conferences can be a bit dismal, can't they? they you know, you feel oh, it's impossible uh, to see examples of how the objectives of zero waste could actually be met in particular communities and societies, and gets people thinking, well, maybe we could do that much better. But it's pretty good to have those examples. Uh, questions. Please, uh, there's a lady with a microphone. Have you got your hand up as well? Yeah, and I have already, so... I suppose you're allowed to, isn't she? Um, I'm using her privilege. Yeah. <laughs> I'm using my power. Um, uh, I would like to, to, to ask you, what do you think is the better alternative? Um, looking at the case from, from uh, California, I'm not too much into it, but they, they made a ban on plastic bags. Not a total ban, but a ban. Um, so, so that is a way of handling uh, uh, this, this waste issue. Another way is, um, Piotr, like you showed uh, these consumer-based initiatives with stores that, where you, where you um, bring your own reusable bag instead of taking a new plastic bag every, every time. Which model do you think is a smarter one? Because I think that um, these consumer-based initiatives, there is some... They, they will, it, will, it will always be limited, I think, to this urban certain kind of the, certain part of the population, and it will it will be a very slow process, at least spreading it out to the whole population. Whereas the the ban um, alternative is very effective, it could be at least, and also it 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 in, um, it um, creates this need for uh, for development in the in the in the field. So there will in, there would immediately be an. Uh, um, yeah, some thought, thoughts, ill development. Thoughts about uh, plastic bag bans. Yes, yeah, I guess you all have a, <laughs> something to say on this. Uh, yes, we've been uh, promoting the plastic bag free day 
it's the 3rd of July for many years already. It's an international day of action against plastic bags. I think it's a, it's, it's a great example of the kind of waste that should not be produced in the first place. Um, I think, I'm not sure about the details on the legislation in California, but I think whatever they did, it's a great first step because definitely plastic bags are a real problem. Um, in marine litter are mm -hmm. devastating for the seas and it's really uh, something that we could, by, by now I think we should be able to find alternatives to plastic bags, definitely. On plastic bags bans, yes, it is radical. Prob it, it is also most effective, but as also zero waste philosophy is that it should come from the locals, from the, from the people, uh, not nothing imposed. But in this case, we have a good uh, reason in um, European uh, um, uh, how it, uh, the consultation, the, um, the, the citizens, they, they have responded, 70% of them, they want a ban, even in European. So what, we, what, what the European Union done now is reduction only, not the ban. Although ban is also happening in Italy, in France also recently. So I would say yes, it is um, the most also, um, radical but also very good for the industry. At least they know what they, where they can invest and where they cannot. This is also very important for the industry. And uh, uh, something against ban. We, ban has to be also very well thought through. Uh, if we ban plastic bags, but we allow also degradable plastic bags that are uh, common here in England, actually, which are uh, fake uh, degradable bags, they are they just uh, um, go into small particles, and it's even more difficult to collect the littering from that. You know, so so it has to be well thought through. There is in the UK though. We we will be having in England the plastic bag tax is coming in, which is already happening in already in Wales and in Ireland. In Ireland they found two consequences they weren't expecting. One of which was a lot less litter, because a lot of it's plastic bag. And the other one's increasing sales in bin liners. Because a lot of people use plastic bags to line bins and so people are then having to buy bags to line bins. Yeah. Um, as a sort of supplementary to that, um, uh, after plastic bags, are there other things which we should be banning? Are they plastic bags unique or is it part of a more general strategy? The, the plastic bags was, is an iconic symbol of mm, wrong packaging and it, it opens a uh, um, window for others, other uh, issues uh, that I mentioned in my presentation. There are lots of packaging items that are made from in, uh, plastic that is not recyclable. This should be banned. So, and it also made a lot of, as, a, as it is iconic, it, it gained a lot of media attention and showed people that we are, we have to really forget about single use items if they are not necessary. So just the start. Yeah, I think the, the idea is that single use products are just designed for the landfill or for the incinerator and doesn't make any sense in terms of sustainability. And so we should, precisely we should be looking at them, identify them and redesign them, yeah. not produce them not produce them or just redesign them yeah. in a different way. Mark? Well, just the, the only thing, you gave an example of pay as you throw, whereas we're, of course, the only European country, I believe, that has that totally illegal in this country. It's written into our law that you cannot directly charge householders for how much waste they produce mm -hmm. and is unlikely to change. So a lot of the stuff that works in Europe, because you have an incentive, um, householders in the UK have zero responsibility for their waste. Mm. And I think until that changes, mm. we're not going to see a fundamental change. Because you can incentivise all you like, but actually the thing that really makes a difference is when it hits people in their pockets. Yeah. I mean, I'm old enough to remember, and I guess some of the people are, when you didn't, it wasn't wasn't a legal obligation to wear a seatbelt. And we used to have campaigns on the telly of people being thrown through the windscreen, being killed, their children dying, all of this. So people still didn't wear seatbelts. They brought in a fine like that, everyone put a seatbelt on. Yeah, yeah pay as you systems are very effective. Um, and it's very unfortunate that this is the situation in the UK and maybe it's, uh, Good idea to start a campaign on it. We we have started a campaign on it. Yeah. Was there another question? Um. Sort of microphone. Ah, oh. oh, gent gentleman over here, lady over here. Thank you. 
Thanks for that. Um, you are. I'm Joe Newbegin uh, from UKLA, the UK Environmental Law Association. Um, we've just been talking about um, negative legislation in the sense of banning things and campaigns to stop things. I want to move slightly more to the context of positive legislation that enables things, and specifically in the area of food waste. Um, I've been, my attention has been drawn to things like skipping and gleaning and other means of redistributing food waste. Um, skipping, of course, being taking um, supermarket surplus food and eating that or redistributing it. Gleaning being going to farms, fields, and taking, say, uh, things that haven't been harvested and, again, redistributing them. It seems that the main problem here is regulatory stumbling blocks, um, things like food safety legislation that's come out of um, both domestic legislation and European legislation. Are you aware of anything which is any measures in Europe or any measures in the UK which are helping to enable these systems of um, reducing food waste to become more effective and legal? Yes, yeah, it's, it's a general issue for any kind of material we call recyclant. You need some kind of standard as to what is acceptable in relation to that, yes. But any thoughts from the panel? No, there aren't any as far as I'm aware. There aren't any plans to make those systems easier. The, yeah. the, there is a new communication um, plan from the Commission on Sustainable Food Supplies, something like that. Uh, which is going to also tackle this issue. There, there are many programs trying to uh, respond to the questions you just raised, to the obstacles in, in, uh, in the legislation. So, But it remains one of the biggest challenges. I mean, <laughs> one of, for us in, in Europe, um, in, in our advocacy for the waste legislation, we've been saying for a long time that we want a bio-waste policy in itself, uh, a directive that tackles specifically um, organic waste. Um, because we want the source separation, we want to deal with the food waste and all these situations that you're saying. And so far, it's been really hard to actually um, develop specific legislation for that. Was there a final question? Do you think it's bad marketing, uh, people wanting to throw away their food as soon as it hits the expiration date, rather than leaving it until it goes, say, mouldy, and that may, may cut down things. I'm just saying, like, it's, it's bad marketing. You can still use your food until it goes off. But RAP have done a huge amount on this, just the Love Food, Hate Waste campaign. It's used as, actually, it's used an example throughout Europe, and they've revisited the whole labelling system now. So often now when you buy stuff, it doesn't say freeze on day of purchase, it says freeze before, best before date. Um, try and rationalising the labelling systems. But part of the problem that relates to this and to the previous question is the, hate to use it, the way we, um, really for the potential lawyers, want to, seem to want to sue everybody when anything goes wrong. It used to be that every so often someone got, you ate something that was a bit dodgy, you took the risk, oh well. And, and now we don't, we just think, oh, well, that's awful, we should sue them. But it's our fault. It's not theirs. Yeah. Right. It's a very but, healthy, but I mean, healthy I mean, response. I mean, some of the labelling yeah. systems are really, frankly, quite confusing. So if you buy bananas, right, there are some ban bags of bananas where the bags are designed to extend the life of the bananas. Now... Everybody I know who buys bananas in a bag, which you shouldn't really do anyway, but if it extends a life, blah, 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 takes them out of the bag as soon as they get home, which is what you do with all your fruit. So having a bag that's specifically designed to extend the life of those bananas, but not all bananas, just some makes, is just a total waste of time because you don't read. Does anyone read through the bags on their fruit and veg when they buy them? No, you don't, do you? So, so some of the stuff where they're being really clever, it's pointlessly clever. Is it, is it more retraining people, the consumers, rather than lawyers wasting their time coming up with other pieces of legislation that's just going to complicate the system, where we just need to educate the people on the ground? I, th I think we need to be a lot less risk-averse and just more often give it a go. Perhaps, uh, uh, perhaps that's a bit of advice for life. Uh, it seems a, <laughs> seems a good point on, uh, on which to uh, conclude the... Uh
discussion. I'm within 10 minutes of where I was supposed to be in uh, uh, g giving some concluding remarks. Well, I, I, I just feel I've had a lovely day. It's been re really <laughs> good. And I've, I've listened to 16 uh, speakers, I think, and I've enjoyed every minute of it, and I'm grateful those 16 speakers for giving this wonderfully diverse collection of insights and experiences on the en environment. That's surely the right way of doing things. And I'm profoundly grateful not just to the 16, but also to the 15, who are the numbers of faces on the uh, photographs on the website of the organising uh, committee with um, Jocelyn and Ale at the forefront. There's a whole gang of folks behind them who have been reminding me when people to stop speaking and making sure the uh, slides are right. It's been superbly well run. I'm just thinking that at some stage in the near future you might be writing a C CV amongst your academic achievements. You can say I participated in a conference which Professor Howard said was superbly well organised, <laughs> uh, faultlessly professional in every respect, and maybe this will swing your chances of getting a job, so I'm happy to be quoted uh, on that. Um, it, it's, been, it's, been, it's, been it's been great. Um, maybe you ought to have a little round of applause for all the people. <laughs> housekeeping announcement I should be making or Jocelyn make those. thank you this is Jocelyn by the way Hi. this is Ali my co chair um, yes uh, just just a few words um, before we end a bit of housekeeping and um, just some thank yous so it's as uh, Professor Howard said, it's been fantastic to have such a great, receptive and, and varied audience. And certainly, we've noticed many um, great conversations going on, and we hope those will continue um, shortly in the, um, in the wine reception. Um, just, just before um, Professor Howard much more ably ties up the strands, um, I'd just like to say um, the final thank yous um, to everyone who's been involved. It's been a real um, labor of love from many, many quarters. So, as you all know, the speakers have been great. Um, many of them have, have traveled from afar. Um, you know, from uh, a lot of the running around there's, there's been and, and speakers having to leave that they're all very busy people. And we're very, very grateful for their time. So I'd just like to thank them. Um, equally, our sponsors, um, or we should say our partners, because they're more than just a kind of a pecuniary um, source uh, to us, although that is extremely important when we're looking to uh, focus on some really important issues and get that out to the general um, population and to, to impecunious students. So um, Queen Mary's University of London, University College London, uh, City University and City Law School and um, Cass Business School, once more, who have been great with catering uh, and events. They've all been phenomenal. Um, I should say Professor Howarth, who's been uh, tireless, Thank you for asking. Um, humorous, <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, a great synthesizer and et cetera, et cetera. So I have a feeling you'll get the call next year as well. You might. <laughs> um, have I missed anyone? Um, I'd also like to say thank you again to Professor Howarth. Uh, he's been not only knowledgeable, entertaining, and immensely likable, but he's also managed to ensure that the conference has run smoothly and on time. So thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much to everyone for coming. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed today's conference. Next year will be the 10th anniversary of Peel UK. So do ensure that you keep in touch with us on Twitter and Facebook because we'll have something very special lined up next year. Uh, for now, there is a drinks reception upstairs in the courtyard, so I hope to see you there. And if you require CPD points, please make sure you go to registration because we require your signature at the end. Thank you very much.